Well, good morning. It's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insegna Booksellers. And uh, this morning, uh, as usual, it's an important morning because every time I come on live, I feel a sense of excitement uh, in that I uh, continue this work on world history, which has given me so far so much um, pleasure. Uh, and uh, I recommend it to, to anyone who's in the third age to actually pick up on uh, this important study. Because when you've lived for quite a while, uh, you want to know about your own history and uh, that of your family, of your local area, of your state, of your nation, of, uh, of the world, in that order. Or maybe the other way around. It doesn't matter. What's important about history is that um, it gives us uh, the idea that life itself for humans is a cycle. And that we go from one generation to the next. And uh, each generation leaves something behind. So each person within uh, within the, you know, the, 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 this time frame uh, contributes to human history. Welcome to Frank Matsaka. And uh, history, therefore, is a very important uh, area of study. As, as I repeat it, for people in the third age, uh, because, you know, the people in the middle age, you know, when they are in the middle of life, they're working, families, uh, traveling, you know, you got strength, etc. But when you get to the third age, and as you move on in life, you what you want to reflect on what has gone on in your own life, and uh, come to grips with the fact that we are human. We do make mistakes, and but we also do some wonderful things. And uh, look all around us now, you know, the progress that has been made by humanity. Some people might say it's not progress at all, but I, I think I think that uh, you know we have to be nice to each other, in the sense of um, in the sense. Welcome to Angela Imela, and yes, uh, uh, you know, continue to to build on what what has gone on. Of course, there are changes, and the changes are sometimes repeats of past cycles. Uh, this morning, for example, I'm going to start with Europe and I'm going to start with um, the, the, the times when uh, the towns in Europe were really filthy. filthy. And in, during the early part of the Middle Ages, before the Renaissance, uh, there was a lot of, um, there, there were a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of disease. Uh, and people thought, that, oh, well, let's God send us this, this disease. When in fact it was uh, the the lack of uh, uh, the lack of hygiene, the lack of uh, infrastructures within the towns, and that's how it comes on. So that's uh, that's uh, where we are. I will then continue, of course, my journey uh, through China. Uh, China is uh, an important uh, world power, has been an important world power for uh, many uh, millennia from the third, fourth uh, millennium before Christ, you know, there's, they were already writing uh, what was going on and, you know, they, they got there in terms of what we call civilization a lot earlier than in Europe. Now, of course, uh, you know, they experienced, for example, the feudal system about a thousand years before that happened in Europe. So let's not forget that China, that the Roman Empire knew about China. Not all of them, not all people, but you know the ones uh, in uh, in power, the ones who had knowledge of you know people's travels and uh, the collection of taxes, they would know. Uh, then I'll go to the Americas. The Americas are coming to an end with the notes on uh, uh, ancient history. And today, you know, they, they've got a, an election over there. Uh, may the, you know, well, may that democracy continue in the nicest possible way rather than being a nasty affair. Uh, you know, just look at Australia. We're doing all right here. 
when we have elections, somebody loses or whatever, we make sure that the votes are counted properly. But there are always mistakes, so one has to understand that. And then uh, after that, the Americas, are before the invasion, and we go to the number of languages that uh, were, were spoken uh, within Australia by Indigenous Australians, by the Aborigines, uh, you know, by the natives, whatever you want to call the people who lived here before uh, the invasion. Now, uh, following that, I'll, of course, go to Banjo Patterson and, uh, and Henry Lawson, two great colonial writers, and, uh, and finally, I'll visit, I'll continue to visit Lake Argyle. Uh, stay with me on that one, Lake Argyle, as we're moving from, uh, uh, from Darwin towards, uh, t towards Broome. Okay, that was, uh, I can't remember now, July. I think we <laughs> went up in July, we went in July. Okay, so you will, uh, you know, I, I like to, to share my, my filming and my pics. I love, you know, doing this sort of work. And I enjoy it very much. Thank you. Okay, so it's 11.30, time to, to start. Okay, so this one here is, we, we, we finished with, um, you know, we finished with, uh, what did we say? Uh, fixed price and wages, you know, the, the guilds that were developed in Europe in the, in the small towns, etc. In the towns of Europe at the time. Okay. Dirty conditions of medieval towns. Now, let's not forget, I'm picking up these, um, these notes from uh, a book uh, from England, uh, or local, but concentrating on English history. Uh, there's also plenty of examples of this type of thing in the rest of Europe. Okay, so dirty conditions of medieval towns were almost unimaginably dirty places. Many people thought that the, that disease, diseases were caused by witchcraft or the stars or even uh, that they were sent by God to punish sin. Uh, so the townsfolk did not trouble their heads with such matters as drainage, health regulations or public hygiene were unknown. Bathrooms had disappeared with the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire had the bathrooms, running water, hot water, all that, all that went over the centuries and they had gone backwards. That doesn't mean that humanity always goes forwards, sometimes it goes backwards. So the upper stories of the houses usually projected towards each other across the narrow winding streets from which sunlight was thus excluded. So vitamin D, you know, people who stayed inside, small. And, of course, the, the streets weren't, uh, there were no stones there. They just threw the rubbish in there. Rubbish, however, was not, you know, for which sunlight was thus excluded. Rubbish, however, was not. Plenty of rubbish thrown into the street, including faces and, uh, you know, human excrements. There were no footpaths and in the single gutter, or depression that wound along the middle of the street, stinking garbage and filth of all kinds collected. The citizens were through rubbish and slops from their windows onto the unsavoury pile. A heavy rainstorm might have washed some of it away into the neighbouring river from which perhaps people drew water for drinking and cooking. Just imagine everyone throwing their rubbish in the street and no one collects it and uh, there was no you know, asphalt at the time. It was just uh, ordinary earth. Welcome to Asunda Lombardia. And Angela Imola, I think I've mentioned, and Frank Manzaka. I appreciate you coming on. A heavy rainstorm might wash some of it away, the neighbouring river from which perhaps people drew water for drinking and cooking. Otherwise, it was usually left undisturbed to provide a playground for stray cats and dogs, rats, mice, flies and germs of all kinds. Think about the way we live now <laughs> and what these people had to put up with. And the kids were playing in the street. So there was a lot of children dying early in life. The Black Death, 1349. 
So it is easy for us to guess the result. Throughout the Dark and Middle Ages, there were constant outbreaks of disease. The most severe of all these epidemics was known as the Black Death. We now know that it was the bubonic plague, a disease carried by certain fleas that feed on rats, but also on human beings. I didn't, they did not come from China either. <laughs> they came from ships, etc., everywhere. In the three years 1348, 1349 and 1350, it swept through Europe. Historians agree that about one-third of the population of Christendom died in that time. And yet, in one way, the Black Death had good results. Yeah, they got rid of one-third of all Europeans. Can you imagine that? One-third of the full population. So out of a population, say, of three million, one million died. So what happened? The, the order, uh, it's like what we've experienced the last couple of years. Uh, so just now let's have a look at what happened. The Black Death transforms many serfs into free labourers. So people were serving lords, this and master. They said, I don't want to be with this guy. I'll go. And they could find work somewhere else. And there was no... So what do we have here in Australia now? A lack of manpower. So what's happening in the farms? They're using robots to put, what do they put? Uh, ma mangoes or avocado pears, you know, with a robot, putting them into, uh, into, into cases, then to be sent out. So that's, you know, when you don't have enough labour, you have to create the technology. When you've got too much labour, like in Egypt with the pharaohs, they built the, the, the pyramids. And a lot of people used to die. And some of the women had to put, uh, what did they put? They put some, uh, you know, when they were building, they needed some, like, glue. Uh, and if they happened to, something happened, and they were pushing a heavy, a heavy stone, you know, big stones, against another stone, and the woman or the person was in the middle, but bad luck, they died on the spot. So that's the Black Death. So many men died that there were not enough villains left to do this essential work on the farms. Landlords had to see their grain rot in the fields or else pay high wages to free labourers. The villains found that if he ran away from his lord, he could find work as a free labourer in another district. That's the important part. His new master was usually so anxious to find workmen that he did not want to find out that his new labourer was really a runaway serf. So the people who received these people here, they, they sort of pretended they didn't know where they came from. Of course they knew, but, you know, it's a survival of the fittest. Thus the Black Death helped, especially in England, to bring an end to the feudal system by transforming a large number of serfs into free labourers. And what happened to Italy here at this time, there was a, uh, I mentioned Giovanni Boccaccio. Giovanni Boccaccio wrote the Decameron, that's a hundred stories. From uh, this time here, they, you know, in Florence there was the Black Death, and so they moved away from Florence into the, into the rest of Tuscany, you know, on a farm so that they could be safer from the disease. And there, there were 10 people, seven women and three guys, and they said, we're going to tell one story each uh, in rotation, uh, and we're going to have 10 stories all together. So 10 by 10 is 100 stories. So the Decameron has got 100 stories. And notice how, you know, Dante too had 34 Inferno, 33 Purgatory, or 33, 33, and 33, plus one introduction, 100. And this magical numbers, 3, 10, 100. Interesting. So that's uh, where we are with, um, you know, the, that's what we've done. We've done 
Uh, a few towns, a little trade early in the Middle Ages, but they were then with the Crusades, with the movement outside of uh, their own uh, nations uh, or counties, uh, you know, and going to the Middle East and bringing all the ideas of uh, uh, of a great civilization that there was there, uh, the world began to become closer. But it had been closer during the Roman times and before in the Mare Nostrum, Nostrum area. So we're talking about a thousand years later, almost the same thing beginning to happen, but in a different circumstance. And there's one person that uh, was responsible in a way uh, to bring even more of the East of China into Europe, and his name was Marco Polo, and his dad, his father and uncle had been travellers, and Marco Polo then went, okay, but we're going to do that next week. And uh, I was watching Netflix, I watched Marco Polo, and they had uh, two series, they're supposed to be five, and then the guy who was making them, I don't want to mention his name, uh, he's a producer of the... the that um, was he was the producer. Uh, he committed terrible things, and uh, therefore the money was withdrawn from the project. So the Marco Polo Marco Polo series did not finish. What a pity, because it was such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Welcome to Marisa San Francavilla. Okay, so I've finished with now uh, with uh, you know men and women making history. And we're going to go to China. We're going to go to China. And, uh, you know, if you remember, I mentioned quite a few names. Wang Zi Gu Kai Zi, uh, Mulan. Uh, you know, these are all uh, Hua Mulan. And I asked someone, do you know about Hua Mulan? He said, yeah, uh, in, my, in my French class of Chinese background, but for, from Malaysia. Anyway. Zhu Chongzi, Zhu Chongzi, the remarkable mathematician. Zhu, Zhu Chongzi, 429 to 500. So he was, what, 71 years old when he died. Zhu Chongzi. Chongzi, C-H-O-N-G, Z-H-I. Zhu, Zhu Chongzi. You can look it up. Go to your phone, or to, you, know, you know, your mobile phone, and if it's one of the good ones, you'll get all your information there, or the tablet, or the computer, if you've got Wi-Fi at home, etc., etc. Okay, Zhu Chongzi, 429-500, lived in the period of the Song and Qi of the Southern Dynasties. He devoted himself to study in his youth, being especially fond of mathematics, he also liked ancient astronomical research. That's what was happening in China, you know, just before 500 after the birth of Christ. That's after the fall of the Roman Empire, when the barbarians were invading Rome and Italy, etc. Zhuk Zhongxi's greatest achievement lay in maths. He calculated a more precise ratio of the circumference of the circumference of a circle. P is the ratio between diameter and circumference of the circle, PI, the P. The ancient Chinese understood this concept very early, but not too accurately. Zhu Zhongzi summed up the experience and decided to use the way of cut circle, cut circle, pioneered by Liu Hui. H-U-I, who lived in the period of the three kingdoms, to seek, to seek P-I, the Pi. However, the computations tools at that time were bamboo sticks. For the, single, for the nine digit arithmetic, 130 times of computation were needed, which was prone to error. Zhu Zhongzi repeated each count at least twice until a few calculations got the same results. 
After working hard on the calculation, he finally reached the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter at between 3.1415926 and 3.1415927. Very, very precise. Zhu Jiangxi was the world's first scientist operator to put pi seven digits after the decimal point. And it was not until the 15th century that an Arab mathematician named al kashi and a 16th century French mathematician, Viette, surpassed him by projecting it to 16 digits after the decimal point. In addition, Zhu Zhongzi compiled his major achievement in mathematics into a book called Zhuishi, Zhuishi? Zhuishu, Zhuishu, which became the main textbook on mathematics in China during the Tang, the Tang Dynasty. Now that's it. Now, quite a bit of this material I did not quite understand. I'm not a mathematician, but I, I remember the pi. So th this is the one I'm going to show you. See that circle? That's, that's what he worked out. Okay, and then he, he got the pi. He got, this was him. That's him. Zhu Chongzi. Okay, and this is in Chinese, of course. But you can learn Chinese now by turning all those symbols into Romanized alphabet. And you know why I know? Because I've got a few books at the shop <laughs> where you can learn Chinese uh, via Romanized alphabet. And in fact, you can also, some of the early books learning for the learning of Japanese were in Romanized alphabet as well. So you can see how, uh, you know, things develop over time. Anyway, that was Zhu Chongzi. Okay, and next time we're going to go to the the quintessential times of um, of the feudal system in China. Now we change again. We got to the Americas before Christopher Columbus, like we, before the invasion for Australia. In America, was the same story. Before Christopher Columbus and the other European voyages went to America, including Amerigo Vespucci. Okay? There were lots and lots of people in the, in the northern part of America and the southern part. And in the middle areas and the northern part, the, the, north, the upper part of southern, of South America, great civilizations were at work the Aztecs, the Maya, etc. So when you do world history, you can go from one uh, continent to another and really discover all these beautiful histories of the world. Okay, now problems with evaluating coastal migration models. We were talking about how did anyone get to North America? We don't know because they did not have writing. That's a problem. For example, in the Maya and the Aztecs, they did not have the will. Everything had to be done on people's shoulders or with donkeys, whatever. I'm not quite sure about the existence of donkeys at the time. There, we might find out later. Okay, but problems with evaluating coastal migration models. The coastal migration models provide a different perspective on migration to the new world, but they are not without their own problems. One such problem is that global sea levels have risen, risen over 120 metres, that's 390 feet. Now, I love this one here. Uh, they call it the New World. It wasn't new for, for, for the Americans, for the people who lived there. Europe was new for them. So when they count the New World, it's, it's always from that uh, perspective of the Europeans. The people who, do, who write, uh, you know, you have to come to an agreement how to call certain things. So for me, there's no new world. There's a world, yes, but, you know, 
work it out. Work it out. Could the Indigenous Australia be called the New World? They'd been here for a long time. And the Sioux or uh, the other Indian, you know, Indigenous uh, tribes of America, uh, they'd been there. Their philosophy is very great, you know, because now we've got books about the way they, you know, the way they, uh, the way the, the civilization worked. Because, you know, in the United States, Christopher Columbus arrived in 1492. And so there's a long period of uh, settlement. And so over that time, then some people would have written up about the various, you know, if you think that people are your enemies, you write about them. Uh, you know, what do they do, what do they eat, and how do they survive, how do they defend themselves, etc. Okay. One such problem is that global sea levels, so uh, let me read it again. The coastal migration models provide a different perspective of migration to the new world, but they are not without their, their own problems. One such problem is that the global sea levels have risen over 100 metres, 390 feet, since the end of the last glacial period. And this has submerged the ancient coastlines that maritime people would have followed into the Americas. Now, we are filming underneath the oceans. So we may not be able to do this, to pick out, you know, the migration, how, how these people actually got there. Finding sites associated with early coastal migration is extremely difficult. Yes, because very far down, but not anymore, not that difficult anymore. And systematic excavation of any site found in deeper waters is challenging and expensive. Who's going to spend the money to find out something which a lot of people may not be interested in? But it's always good for the state to know. Strategies for finding earliest migration sites include identifying potential sites on submerged Paleo shorelines. Paleo, we know that, Paleolithic man, Paleo means old shorelines. Paleo shorelines. Seeking sites in areas uplifted either by tectonic or I saw static rebound. Tecto tectonic, it's when uh, the, the pieces of the earth, you know, like the continents, they bang against each other. That's tectonic and isostatic rebound. I'm not quite sure. We'll have to look it up. And looking for riverine sites in areas that may have attracted coastal migrants. On the other hand, there is evidence of marine technologies found in the hills of the Channel Islands of California. Circa, circa 10,000 BC before Christ. If there was an early pre-Clovis coastal migration, there's always the possibility of a failed colonisation. In other words, you got there and then everyone died. Another problem that arises in the lack of hard evidence found for a long chronology theory. No sites have yet produced a consistent chronology older than about 12,500 radiocarbon years to 14,500 calendar years. But research in South America related to the possibility of early coastal migrants has been limited. And we have to stop there. That's it. So next week I have to come up with something to do with the, the Americas. Or I might do two things. I might talk about the Americas and Africa. I'm going to bring in Africa because the two civilizations, if you like, the Americas, then exploited Africa with slaves, etc. And we've got um, a lot of problem coming out of that. So, we now come to languages of Australia. So, from next week, we'll, we'll do the Americas and 
we start talking about Africa as well. So I will have covered then, uh, I will have covered America or, you know, Europe, Asia, Australia and Africa. And Africa has produced some of the oldest civilizations in the world. But they were so successful that they remained static. That's the Neolithic people. Okay? And I've decided as of next year at the University of the Three Third Age, I'm going to pick up one hour a week on a world history as well to adults. I'll, I'll look forward to it. Um, maybe they said they're not the term one, but uh, term two, they'll give me the time, but I might even start, you know with one or two people beforehand. And definitely, definitely, I'll continue because there's a lot, a lot to be, a lot of history uh, in terms of the the seven continents, if we can, if we counted the North Pole and the South and Antarctica as well. Okay, that's the whole world, the whole world. And one of the things that intrigues me, though, is that, I too, you know, after you've done the world like this, I too, you know, some people become interested in astronomy and reading the stars. I've never had that. I sort of always said, you know, I've, I've looked at the stars in, in terms of and the moon for my poetry, but not really the physical part where you look at the world, at the, at the stars, and you can actually work out what is what and you can name you can name those stars, which group of stars come together, etc., etc. So there you are. You know, the journey continues for me and for you if you follow my uh, presentations. If you need some guidance, but of course you don't need my guidance, you can just go whichever way you want. Go and discover the world and the world of history. Okay, languages of Australia. There were over 200 languages spoken in Australia and perhaps as many as 500 if we include the different dialects of the same language. There you are. This guy here is called the dialects. They, they, they are the local local languages. But in a, in a, a larger area, you've got a variations of the same language and therefore they're called dialects. But I don't like the word dialect anymore because it's a bit of a put-down for me. Uh, you might as well call them local languages. These languages were unique to Australia. They were not like any other languages in the world. There you are. But in the far north, Arnhem Land and Cape York, there were some words borrowed from the languages of the Indonesians and the Torres Strait Islanders. So the further north, next to, you know, to Indonesia and to... New Guinea, you know, it's sort of, it's possible that some of the words would have come across. Most Australian languages had the same sounds and there are a few words which were the same or almost the same in many languages right across the continent. So some of the words travelled, but not all of them. But the same word might have different meanings in different languages. When we say snow, for example, in, where you don't have snow at all. For you, for us, it's snow. But for people who experience snow, for example, in Italian, they got neve, nevischio, nevican. In other words, and if you go further north, let's say towards Scandinavia, the Scandinavian countries, they probably have 10 different names for snow. The thick one, the thin one, the, the one with the wind, the one with etc. Throughout Australia, with few exceptions, stress was on the first syllable of a word. The stress. Padula. That's my surname. Padula. That's, that follows this type of um, idea. There were not many speakers of most of the languages, often only a few hundred. But there were, was usually trade and intermarriage between neighbouring language groups. Also, they might come together regularly for important ceremonies. So people learned to speak at least one other language than their own. Quite often, three or four. They might be able to hear, understand several more. 
Aboriginal languages sounded pleasant to European ears, but there were a, a number of sounds not heard in English. For example, the nj, nj, or as in sing, sing, ng, at the beginning of a word. The grammar was much more complicated than English grammar. That is why very few of the early English settlers were able to learn the local Aboriginal language, and even fewer wrote it down. Now, they didn't give it importance at all. They were the powerful people and they wanted to subjugate them. That's it. And ignore them. But, you know, again, people write books, they have their own opinions. Many of the languages spoken in the south southeastern and southwestern parts of the mainland and in Tasmania have almost disappeared. Because they, within 70 years, the Aboriginal Tasmanians, they were gone. The last one was Truganini. And she died in 1870, long time ago. So now that there are some Aboriginal uh, people in Tasmania, you must have, they have to rewrite history <laughs> in order to exist. Okay, at the same time, the Aboriginals were made to learn English through some of the sounds were very few, very, very hard for them to pronounce. Well, they had to learn, you know, because the others gave food out and could employ them. I don't know. There were sounds in English which did not occur in any of their languages. For example, S, X, Z, F and H. Today, some Aborigines who normally speak their own language but have learned some English say Friday for Friday. They can't pronounce the F like the Chinese, they can't pronounce the R sound. That's a l l l l l sound instead of the R. However, such people usually speak English much better than almost any English-speaking person can speak an Aboriginal language. Of course, it's a national language now. You can't get away with it. That's why now on in the media, it's good to see so many people of different backgrounds and different races actually presenting the news and the current affairs and everything else. Good to see. And that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's a good thing for Australia. We are a beacon to the world, believe it or not. I'm going to stop there. And next week we continue. Okay? Languages and languages of Australia. And now we have my friend, Banjo Patterson, a great Australian. Banjo Patterson. Last week we did, no, hmm? Father Riley's horse. No, we didn't do that, did we do? Yes, Father Riley's horse. That's what we do. Banjo Patterson, yes. By the Starlight Track, that's where we finished. Okay, so this is Father Riley's horse. Okay, let, let, let me continue. And they read the nominations for the races with surprise and amusement at the father's little joke. For a novice had been entered for the stipple chasing prize, and they found that it was Father Riley's smoke, mug. He was neat enough to gallop, he was strong enough to stay. That's Father Riley's horse. But his owner's views of training were immense. For the Reverend Father Riley used to ride him every day, and he never saw a hurdle nor a fence. <laughs> He never saw a hurdle nor a fence. And the priest would join the laughter. Oh, said he, I put him in, for there is a five and twenty sovereigns to be won. And the poor would find it useful if the chestnut chanced to win. And he'll maybe win when all is said and done. <laughs> so in the end of the race, he never, never trained the horse at all. But it was good intentions. If he wins, the money will go to charity. And he had called him Fo Abalag, 
four, F-I-U-G-H, four gabalag, which is French for clear the horse, clear, that's bull, that's not French at all, that's a made up word. And his colours were vivid shade of green. All the Doolies and O'Donnells were on Father Riley's horse, while the or Orangemen were back in Mandarin. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> it was Hogan, the dog poisoner, aged men and very wise, who was camping in the race course with his swag and who ventured the opinion to the township's great surprise that the race would go to Father Riley's, Father Riley's nag. You can talk about your riders and the horse has not been schooled and the fences is terrific and the rest. When the field is fairly going, then you'll see ye all been fooled and the chestnut horse will battle with the best. For there is some has got condition and they think the race is sure and the chestnut horse will fall beneath the weight. But the hopes of all the helpless and the prayers of all the poor will be running by his side to keep him straight. So God was a, will be on, on this horse's side. And it's what the need, the need of schooling or working on the track within the saints are there to guide him round the course. So what's the use of doing any practice beforehand when you've got all the saints on your sides? I've prayed him all over every fence. I've prayed him out and back. And I'll bet my cash on fire the Riley's horse. So there you are. Oh, the steeple was a cautious, was a caution. They went tearing round and round. And the fences rang and rattled where they struck. There were some that cleared the water. Three was more fell in and drowned. Some blamed the men and others blamed the luck. But the whips were flying freely when the field came into view. For the finish down at the long green stretch, of course, and in front of all the flyers, jumping like a kangaroo, came the rank outsider, Father, ride his horse! Oh, the shouting and the cheering as he rattled past the post, for he left the others standing in the straight, and the rider, well, they reckoned it was Andy Regan's ghost. And it beat them how a ghost would draw the, the weight. <laughs> so you weigh the, the horse and then instead of weighing the, the rider, you weigh the, the spirit. Not bad. But he weighed in nine times seven. Then he laughed and disappeared. <laughs> like a banshee, which is Spanish for an elf. I don't know about that one either. And an old Hogan muttered sagely, if it wasn't for the beard, They'll be thinking it was Andy Reagan's self. <laughs> oh dear. And the, and the poor of Carly's Crossing drank the health at Christmas tide of the chestnut and his rider dressed in green. So they dressed them like, you know, the, the Irish. And they drank all the winnings, of course. <laughs> they went for a good cause. There was never such a ride, a rider, not since Andy Reagan died. And they wondered who on earth he could have been. But they settled among them for the story got about, amongst the bushmen and the people on the course, that devil had been ordered to let Andy Reagan out for the steeple chase on Father Riley's horse. So he came from, you know, he came from heaven. Uh, the good Lord had given him a chance to come back. Unlike Dante, who, he brought his body back to heaven. Uh, Father Riley's uh, Andy Reagan came, for, as, came from being a spirit to a human person. And then, of course, <laughs> he probably disappeared on, on the moment when they weighed him down when they, because it would have been too, too heavy and he wouldn't have been able to enter the race. So then Andy Reagan became a spirit again. What a story. It's just a beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Benjo. Until the next one. It's another good one.
a few good ones coming up. Now this one here is Henry Lawson. Henry Lawson. I might even just read it. I've got time. I might finish it off this in a dry season. So in a dry season, we got to and three gods interested. We crossed the Macquarie, a narrow muddy gutter with a a dog swimming across and three goats interested. Okay, we, we, we're going from there. Okay, the, the name of the song, the name of the story is In a Dry Season by Henry Lawson. Okay. A little further on, we saw the first sundowner. He carried a royal Alfred and had a bill in one hand and a stick in the other. He was dressed in a tail coat turned yellow, a print shirt and a pair of moleskin trousers with big square calico cap patches on the knees and his old straw hat was covered with calico. Suddenly he slipped his swag, dropped his billy and ran forward boldly flourishing the stick. I thought that he was mad and was about to attract the train but he wasn't. He was only killing a snake. I didn't have time to see whether he cooked the snake or not. Perhaps he only thought of Adam. <laughs> you, know, you know, you still have to make these references. In other words, killing the snake wasn't for the meat, like with the indigenous people would have killed the snake in order to get the meat. You cut the, the head off and then the rest is okay. Apparently, I even tasted it <laughs> and don't intend to for, for quite a while. Somebody told me that the country was very dry on, on the other side of Never Tire. Never Tire. Good name, Never Tire. It is. I wouldn't like to sit down on it anywhere. The, the least horrible spot in the bush in a dry season, is where the bush isn't. Where it has been cleared away and green crops is trying to grow. They talk of settling people on the land. Better settle in it. I'd rather settle on the water, at least until some gigantic system of irrigation is perfected in the West. With all the water we've had, that's what we need, a gigantic system to bring water everywhere in Australia. Along about the Byrock, we saw the first shearers. They dress like the unemployed, but differ, differ from that body in their looks of independence. They sat on trunks and wool bales and the fence, watching the train and hailed Bill and Jim and Tom and asked how those individuals were getting on. Here we came across soft felt hats with straps round the, crows, the crowns and full bearded faces under them. Also a splendid looking black tracker in a masha uniform and a pair of Wellington boots. One or two square cuts and stand up collars struggle dismally through to the bitter end. Often a member of the unemployed starts cheerfully out with a letter from the government Labor Bureau in his pocket and nothing else. He has an idea that the station where he has the jobs will be within easy walking reach, walking distance of Burke, that's where he is. Perhaps he thinks there'll be a cart or a buggy waiting for him. He travels for a night and and day without a bite to eat. And on arrival, he finds that the station is 80 or 100 miles away. <laughs> you get to the station, there's nothing there. Then he has to explain matters to a publican and a coach driver. God bless the publican and the coach driver. 
God forgive our social system. <laughs> Native industry was represented at one place along the line by three tiles, a chimney pot and a length of piping on a slab. Somebody said to me, you want to go out back, young man? If you want to see the country, you want to get away from the line. I don't want to. I don't want to. I've been there. You could go to the brink of eternity as far as Australia is concerned and yet meet an animated mummy of a swagman who will talk of going out back, out upon the outback find. About Byrock, we met the bush liar in all his glory. He was dressed like, like a bush larrikin. His name was Jim. He had been to a ball where some blank had, had touched his blanky overcoat. The overcoat had a check for 10 quid in the pocket. He didn't seem to feel the loss much. What's 10 quid? He'd been everywhere, including the Gulf country. He still had three or four sheds to go. He had telegrams in his pocket from a half a dozen squatters and super offerings, him pens on any terms. He didn't give a, a blank whether he took them or not. He thought at first he had the telegram on him, but found that he had left them in the pocket of the overcoat aforesaid. He had learned the butcher, butchering in a, in a day. He was a bit of a scrapper himself and talked a lot about the ring. At the last station, whether he saw, he gave the supper, the super, the father of a hiding. The super was a big chap, about six foot three, and had knocked out petty somebody in one round. He worked with a man who shore 400 sheep in nine hours. My God. He shore 400 sheep in nine hours. He was a quiet looking bushman in a corner of the carriage grew, grew restless and presently he opened his mouth and took the liar down in about three minutes. At 5.30 we saw a long line of camels moving out across the sunset. There's something snaky about camels. They remind me of turtles and goannas. Somebody say, here is, here, is a, here is Burke. Somebody said, here is Burke. So in a dry season. That's it. That was Benja Patterson. Story number three. We'll have to find a um, a poem by by uh, Henry Lawson next time. Okay, so let's have a look now. Twelve seventeen. Time for Lake Argyle. Here we go. Let's go and see Australia. Australia. Here we were last week. We were here. Here we were. There. This is Lake Argyle and that's the, we're on the boat. Nice pleasant day. It wasn't. It was a bit cold though. It was windy, a bit windy. But as we moved through, it was. It got much better. See the wind. If you lose your cap here, you won't find it. <laughs> It'll blow away. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the one. Now, the, oh no, we've got more. A bit fast. Look how beautiful it is. On a calmer day, you know, but really, sometimes people rush for time.
Now this is Lake Argyle, Australia Northwest. more. Now we're starting to slow down because I think we're going to see a few things here. Yeah, we're approaching the rocks. Okay, the thing is with with all this is that you're approaching the rocks and you're looking for uh, some native fauna, the animals, also the fish, crocodile, anything. Now that's, hey, I didn't, that's a, a nice pick. More picks, I decided this would have been a better way to study the rocks, etc. Now we're approaching the rocks. And we see, we see something. What do we see? Some people have seen something. There it is. There it is. There it is. They're trying to catch it. There it is. Two of them. Nice picture, that one. Good. Oh. Here we go. I think we're going now. Yes, there they are. Still. Yeah. 
a different one, white one. Okay. Good place to be. That's it. Ah, did I say anything like that? that? Oh, I guess. <laughs> uh, I did get myself a, a selfie with the, with the animal. Moving away from the rocks and back again. Quite a big lake, uh, really. So you can't uh, hear properly too far away. But, you know, there was an explanation about Lake Argyle and its history and uh, what animals there are, what development that, you know, the local government has for it. You know, tourism you know, gives a, a few jobs to a few people, which is good. And these people are waiting for you to go there. I'm just going to check something now and then I'll come back to this. Oh, yes. Keep going. Yes, all right. Let's have a look. Back again. When the boat was fast, <laughs> it was quite a feeling actually. That's a long explanation there. Here we are. I'll say something.
That's it. Keep going. Keep going. The picture seemed to be a lot better. <laughs> I was wondering whether that's beautiful. I suppose the mix of pics and footage is a good one too. You can tell me which one you prefer. Here we go, and I thought, enough of the pigs. <laughs> Nothing I think just on the way back here. Yeah. Good. More. Oh, come on, Tom. We're approaching uh, the end of the tour. I'm actually going to go a little bit longer. I want to finish off. Oh no, there's too much still. There's quite a bit here. Okay, we'll stop. We'll stop there. We'll stop there and we'll continue next week. Okay, thank you very much for coming on today. I much appreciate your, your company and your presence. And um, please, uh, if you follow me, please share this work. Uh, I do need some support in this. Because uh, the more you share it, the, the more uh, history becomes uh, an important aspect of your life and as well. 
and, and the people whom you love, you know, your friends uh, on Facebook, I'm sure will appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much once again. This is Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and in Senior Booksellers. I'll see you next time, next week, hopefully all going well. Okay, ciao, ciao. And now we finish off.